Did you know that April is Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month? Well, this morning, I have with me psychologist at the Children's Authority, Ahelia Ramda, joining me to discuss exactly what that means and how we can observe it and do our part as well. Good morning, Ahelia. Welcome back. Good morning, and thank you so much for having us yet again. How are you doing this morning? I'm okay. Good. All right. Tell me firstly the importance of us observing Child Abuse Awareness Month in April. Okay. So, as we know, it's an annual observance. Every year, we dedicate April to raising awareness and getting that information out there with regards to child abuse, um, how we prevent it, how we identify it, what to do in instances that we find it. And it continues to be an important observance because child abuse and neglect continue to be one of the biggest challenges that face our children in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this uh, campaign or the drive on an annual basis do any any good to be able to say you've seen a, like results of, all right, we, we put this work in, we've made people more aware and we see results as a result of it? Well, what I can say is that the fact that we are receiving more and more reports, mm -hmm. I think is a really good indication that all of the um, awareness drives, all of the sensitizations, all of the workshops, not only in April, but across the year, mm -hmm. is working, is doing something to empower persons to know, hey, you can reach out for assistance, you can reach out for information, you can reach out if there are children that you are aware of that are, require that care and protection. All right. Do you guys have a list of planned activities or, or things that you're doing this month to be able to observe it? So what I want to say is that the entire child protection framework is busy in April. Right. So everyone involved in child protection, whether it be CPU, whether it be Gender and Child Affairs, Children's Authority, everyone is, is focused on doing as many sensitizations, as many workshops, as many programs as possible. So for the Children's Authority, we are continuing with our work. As you mm -hmm. know, we were here quite often over the past few months mm -hmm. as the media highlighted some really unfortunate cases. And so the conversation, thankfully, has started, unfortunately, but thankfully, has started much earlier than April this year for yeah. us. And we will continue to do our media appearances, television stations, radio stations, going into you know various communities for various sensitizations. Um, and I know that Child and Gender, Gender and Child Affairs, who was mm -hmm. supposed to join us this morning, I know that they have recently launched a, an In the Know campaign, which is taking them into various communities to do exactly that. Meet with parents, meet with children, give them the information about mm -hmm. identifying, but not only identifying, but safeguarding our children. So busy month, lots of activities, lots of spaces to get the information. Well, you know what? This is one space that we can get the information out, right? So let's start with, with the basics. Mm -hmm. Define child abuse for us as basic as, as possible so that everybody understands what we're dealing with. So child abuse is the physical maltreatment of a child or the sexual molestation of a child. Um, when we talk about child abuse, it's usually used interchangeably with neglect, mm -hmm. which is a distinct term unto itself. But when we talk about maltreatment, it covers it as well. And we know there are various forms of neglect. There's physical neglect, so withholding clothing and items that they actually need, emotional neglect, educational neglect, medical neglect, and... Uh, that is a fairly unknown one, but you would be surprised how often our children are not being given the opportunity to seek medical attention and medical mm. care, um, as well as financial neglect. So it's so many different forms of neglect, so many different ways that we can maltreat children that we have been seeing has been occurring across Trinidad and Tobago. And how do, I, how do we identify these things to be able to say we want to... A, prevent it, mm -hmm. or B, uh, get involved to, to fix it. Mm -hmm. I have a little caveat that I always say before I launch into this science is that it's important that parents and caregivers and know anyone, you know, interacting with children, know their children, mm -hmm. build genuine relationships, because that's how you're going to be able to identify that something is off with your child. Because many of the symptoms do mirror normal developmental challenges that we see in children as they move through mm -hmm. um, childhood into adolescence, or they can also mirror when other things are happening with children, right? So we want to be mindful of changes in their usual personality, usual behavior patterns. We want to look for withdrawal, or on the flip side, if they become um, very clingy, very attached to particular persons, we want to be mindful of if they've withdrawn from their friends, or if they've pull themselves back from interacting with persons. We want to look out for things like physical marks and scars. Mm -hmm. And in terms of sexual abuse, we want to look out for blood, suspicious stains in their undergarments, um, possibly even increased body odor um, for more adolescent aged um, young people or children. We want to look out for things like increase in aggression. 
right? Even things like a dip in school performance and all of these things kind of give us an idea that something is going on with our child. We need to get to the bottom of it. We need to find out what's happening. And these are just a few of the signs mm -hmm. that can happen, that you can, you know, notice. And these, I mean, those signs that you talk about there, they go from uh, children, like the, the babies almost, to teenagers, straight to yes. or are there different signs as they so, get older? I mean, they're, they're more or less the same signs. It just might present in a different way. Mm -hmm. So yes, for the younger children, you might see them lashing out um, and becoming aggressive, you know, wanting to, you know, man their territory for yeah. the older adolescents. It's engaging in fights, sometimes very little provocation, and they're going to launch into fighting and mm -hmm. these things. For the older ones also, absconsion is a huge risk. So running away from home. Yeah. Yeah, so whether they're running to a perpetrator, right, because now that's what they know, or they're running from a perpetrator, mm -hmm. um, or just wanting to get into a safe space. Another really um, good indicator is when we have kids that are in school or in the community centers for prolonged periods of time. They're avoiding going home. Right. They're avoiding going to a particular place. Or children that avoid particular people. Mm. Right. So if you find a little bit finicky around a particular uncle or auntie or this one or that one, that's something to be aware of. A lot of the times in our culture, we push or force our children to interact with adults, yeah. with aunties, so and so, uncle, so and so. And we're not mindful that of their discomfort and the fact that there might be a reason for that discomfort. So we want to respect children and their physical space mm -hmm. as well. Um, I always tell parents, let's cut that habit. Let's stop forcing our children to kiss and hug every mm. single person. Let's listen to them. If they don't feel comfortable, they don't feel comfortable. And that empowers them to say when someone has encroached on their personal space or touched them inappropriately because they know that they have that autonomy over their own bodies. Yeah. And I, I think it's also important for us to realize that sometimes parents might confuse uh, having manners mm -hmm. and that greeting of a person with, with that same thing we just discussed there. So yes. it's okay for them to say, you know, hi, good morning or whatever the case is, but they don't have to hug and kiss. Yes. Yeah, so you so. can be respectful without exactly. pushing the boundary. Um, tell me about some of the myths around mm -hmm. child sexual abuse in particular. So... <laughs> Child sexual abuse, um, it's always an interesting topic. It's a very, very sad topic. Um, and a lot of the times when we have children who have been sexually abused, whether it's male or female, there's this idea that they look for it somehow. Mm -hmm. And it is tied to victim shaming and victim blaming. Mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about rape and sexual assault and all of these things, um, that, you know, they're fresh, they're out there, they're looking for it. Um, so we want to be mindful of that. We want to be mindful that grooming is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And that at times, even if it may seem like, you know, that, that, that idea or perception, children are groomed from very young by persons very close to them. Um, and we want to be careful that we don't put them in that category to blame them or I want to, you to make them pull away. Yeah, I want you to break down that grooming aspect mm -hmm. of things because I think people often mistake that and don't understand what it looks like. What does it look like when you see a child being groomed or starting that process? So grooming... Is, is a huge topic in, in and of itself. I mean, it's when an, an, an individual, it could be a relative, it could be someone's close to the family, a complete stranger, they step in and they attempt to befriend the child, right? So they will take um, interest in that child um, that may seem strange or, you know, a little bit too much, and they develop a relationship with that child that is outside of their relationship with anyone else. Mm -hmm. So even if they're their way in is befriending the parents or the other older persons in the family. Eventually, you will see that they draw close to that child. And what happens then is that they befriend that child with gifts, with compliments, um, with a listening ear, with a shoulder to cry on. Um, they start to pull that child away from the family. Mm. So they, they make that child believe that I am the person who's here for you. I am the person who's providing for your needs. They don't love you as much as I love you. They don't care for you as much as I care for you. They're not going to do for you as I'm doing for you. Mm -hmm. And very soon, that child begins to draw Present closer to family. that person, yeah. seek out help from that person, seek out attention, um, you know, affirmation from that particular individual. And then the relationship slowly changes. I want people to be aware that grooming is a, is a long game, <laughs> right? It's not today for tomorrow. Yeah. It is something that happens over months, years. 
and but very I, soon i find i find though that it, there's a there's a line a distinction mm -hmm. that needs to be drawn between what can be considered grooming versus mentorship mm -hmm. for example so like you know you can say that befriending or somebody you might see a talent in somebody and you say and i take interest in this person for that talent or whatever but what you mentioned just now about pulling them away from the family mm -hmm. is the is the key part it's isolating them and then the relationship changes mm -hmm. um where it's less of the above board type of things and then you have the requests coming in the mm -hmm. requests for pictures the requests for meeting up the requests for not don't tell your parents that you're meeting me and very soon it becomes sexual in nature mm -hmm. and that's how you know you can miss it because you're thinking they just have an interest and if you're a family that's coming that's underprivileged and you don't have the resources and this person is now funneling resources because that's another strategy yeah in addition to giving the child things, they're the now giving too. the family mm -hmm. money or groceries or something that is meant to hush mm -hmm. or to help them turn that blind eye. So we need to be mindful of those things. Again, it's not black and white. It's not clear cut. It's not straightforward. You just have to be so aware and you have to trust your instincts and you have to be mindful of what is appropriate, what is inappropriate, you will eventually start to notice the little touches, mm -hmm. the way that they look at your child, you know, the way that your child interacts with them will also change over time. And in a case like that, right, if you see somebody interacting with your child in that way and you get suspicious, mm -hmm. what, I mean, besides obviously running them from your life, mm -hmm. what can you do? Is there anything that you can do from a, a legal perspective that says, hey, this person is trying to groom my, my son or my daughter? Well, I'm not a lawyer, <laughs> but I can't say that if we do notice this, I mean, and it's dangerous behavior, mm -hmm. you can file a restraining order against someone who you would like to not be in proximity to yourself, mm -hmm. child, um, and then you report it. You report it to the CPU, you report it to the children's authority, such and such individual has been doing X, Y, and Z. And, you know, it's investigated the relevant steps followed through with. Mm -hmm. And in terms of a, a situation of alleged child abuse mm -hmm. where, you know, you get that information and you say, well, they say so and so happened. Well, how do you how do you as a citizen respond to that? What is what is the steps that we should be taking? Should we confront them? Should we just report it and let children's authority and the, and the authorities, the other legal authorities and entities deal with it? So it's twofold and mm -hmm. it's a bit tricky. <laughs> right. Um, we do not want to encourage citizens to put themselves in harm's way or in danger mm -hmm. right so if you observe something going on we're not saying rush in and get yourself into trouble but we are saying report it immediately call the police if something is actively happening and you can help defuse it mm -hmm. and it's safe you know that's 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 your judgment that's you know maybe it's in a family setting but i'm not going to say rush into the neighbor's yard or rush into you know um, a public brawl if you, you're not sure of what's going on, you don't know who has a concealed weapon, mm. all of these things to be mindful of, right. but report it right away. We have this thing now, unfortunately, where we pull out a phone to record. And sometimes, as we have seen, the recordings do help us and lead us to the perpetrators yeah, and the these perpetrators. things. But your first action should be to report it, call mm -hmm. the police um, so that they can intervene immediately. And um, so in any circumstance, if you become aware of children who are being maltreated, you want to report. You can report anonymously. You can call 996, which is the Children's Authority. You can contact the CPU and report. And um, the other thing is in your own spheres of influence, you need to start calling out behaviors that just aren't right. And that is easier said than done, but it's something that we need to do. We need to bring this conversation to the forefront. Mm -hmm. We need to hold our brothers and sisters and grandparents and uncles and aunts and whomever accountable for the way that they speak to children, for the way that they um, decide to discipline children. We need to move away from punishment, move closer to discipline and teaching and guiding our children towards a better path um, mm -hmm. than punishing, than belittling, than humiliating and ridiculing, which is what still happens in a really large scale. Yeah, and I mean, I know we had a conversation about that in detail. So if you mm -hmm. want to find out more about the difference between punishment and discipline, you can check out that interview. It's actually posted on our TTT Live online as well. Um, what happens, though, in the other side of things? If I have that information, I see something going on, and I say, well, I'm not getting involved. That's not my business. Mm -hmm. And I do nothing with that information. So under the law... <laughs> ah, now we get to the law. Under the law, you have to report child abuse. Right. Right. Um, children are a vulnerable population. They are dependents. And so we have to be mindful that it is your responsibility mm -hmm. to protect children and to report when they are being ill-treated. And there, there's a penalty. 
there's possible jail time. Um, and we want to be mindful that persons in positions of trust, so persons like teachers and coaches and nurses and doctors, psychologists, persons who are charged with care of children, they carry higher sentences, higher fines, because you have been entrusted this child and you failed to report or you failed to um, act. Um, and again, if you're a person in a position of trust and you are, of course, abusing a child as well, we have to be mindful that there is just a heavier penalty that is coming towards you. So we want to be mindful that child protection is everyone's business. We have to start get back to that place where we're looking out for each other, where we're doing the needful, and that is being mindful of how we speak to children, how we treat with children, how we discipline children, and how we seek help for them when we realize that they do in fact need help. Hey, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Of course. And all the best, of course, for the rest of the Child Abuse Awareness and Prevention Month. I know that you guys have a lot of work in store, yes. and we thank you so much for spreading that information. Guys, we take a quick break, and we come back with more on the Now Morning Show. Stick around. Now we sing it again. Watch out, my children. Watch out, my children. Watch out, my children.